So good afternoon, everyone. Um, my name is Asla Aydın Taşbaş, and happy to see you all and be back with my ECFR family. We're going to have a little therapy session that we badly need, but uh, hopefully also do a bit of a post-mortem on the Turkish elections and and also have a bit of uh, look forward in terms of what the new Erdogan 3.0 period would mean for Europe, for United States and for Sweden. This is an unmoderated session. We'll be moderating each other. I'll start out um, uh, blabbering a little bit on what I think and then pass it on to Sinan and we'll be, do back and forth. I don't want to do too long a post-mortem on the elections because I think we need to talk about uh, uh, the new Erdogan period. But a few points. Um, you know, it's very clear that President Erdogan's bid promised to make Turkey great again his idea of a non-aligned Turkey, a nationalist Turkey that with its, as a rising power, has done better, has won greater approval than the opposition's bid for rule of law and a pro-Western foreign policy. Uh, yes, there were irregularities, there is an uneven playing field, the elections were really not fair, but at the end of the day, at least half the population, and possibly more, 52%, but you know, at least half the population bought the idea of a rising Turkey, a non-aligned Turkey. This is what I call Turkey's post-West moment. And we have to adjust to this reality. It's, it's very difficult for us on a personal level, as an analyst, I think it's very difficult for, for many of Turkey's NATO allies, but what, this perhaps, and Sinan can disagree with me, but this perhaps was the last exit uh, for a return to the West and, and, and that exit has passed. President Erdogan's campaign was called the century of Turkey. Turkey is obviously one of the important pivotal powers, middle powers to watch, uh, consequential. Um, the century of Turkey, he said, it's an inevitable rise. It's a rise despite the West, against the rest in some, West in some instances, but this can only happen my, under my stewardship. And I think, you know, um, as many populists with a very effective campaign, he has convinced, um, convinced uh, the public. There have been irregularities. I don't want to delve too much into it, but you know, maybe um, on the elections, um, Erdogan ran against a very weak candidate and, and I think Sinan w will talk about that and he could really unpack that. But I also want to draw your attention to the fact that 48% of the public, of the Turkish population, voted for change under circumstances that are very different from the voting process in Western uh, democracies, particularly in the countryside, particularly in Eastern Turkey, particularly in big provinces. And those 48% uh, represent nearly all major cities, the coastline, people who produce Turkey's GDP, the bulk of Turkey's GDP. So their dreams may be postponed, uh, but they're not going to be quashed. Um, the issue of what happens now, what the opposition does uh, from this point on will be important. For the next five years, it's going to be a strong institutionalized Erdogan rule, a personalized rule that will be now institutionalized, but there are some uh, elements to Erdogan's next term that we need to discuss. But maybe, Sinan, let me pass it on to you uh, now for the uh, post-mortem. Yes, thank you, Asla. Um, when I first received the invitation from Mark, I saw him somewhere there, you know, um, I accepted Please. this invitation with great zeal. And the reason why I did that is not only because this is a, you know, invaluable opportunity to, to speak uh, before such a distinguished audience, but also I thought that I would be speaking about how the new Turkey would engage with Europe. And I had already done, you know, quite a bit of preparation, talking points, looking at several elements of what I wanted to share with you. 
Now, of course, the situation is very different. Uh, the patient, uh, we lost the patient, and we now have to do the post-mortem. So I had to rehash my talking points. And um, I thought that doing the post-mortem, looking at what went wrong, rather than doing that, I thought I would share with you some elements of how you challenge a populist authoritarian government in a way that might have a resonance to some sort of rapport for other jurisdictions, other polities that <laughs> face the same conundrum. But rather than giving you a list of do's, I will give you a list of don'ts. And I'll start with, don't start the race with your weakest candidate. Now, no brainer. It seems like no brainer, right? But that's exactly what happened. And that makes it even more tragic. Because interestingly enough, this was definitely a race that the opposition could have won. Unlike previous ones where Erdogan was in the lead, he was the favorite, and he won. This time around, that wasn't the case. And it still is not the case in the sense that the largest political party in Turkey is the anti-Erdogan party. That remains true, despite the fact of him getting 52%. Because ultimately, it's also about mobilization. And Erdogan is a leader that is very adept, very skillful at mobilizing his grassroots. So you needed a leader that was as skillful as him in, doing the, in, in, in instilling the same type of political dynamic, the same motivation, the same energy. That's where the leadership failed. It didn't fail in absolute numbers. We were confident because of the absolute numbers. But we failed because of relative numbers, because the mobilization rate between the two worked to the favor of Erdogan and to the detriment of the opposition. So therefore, the first don't is don't start the race with your weakest candidate. The second don't is don't underestimate the power of information control. Uh, I'll give you a few, a few figures just to give you a context of how powerful that is. The ability to shape the narrative, but not only the ability to shape the narrative, the ability to constrain the other, the, uh, the opposition to speak to your own electorate. That's what's been decisive in Turkey. TRT, the state-owned channel. We fund it. I fund it from my own pocket. Aslı funds it. There may be other Turks in the audience that do. TRT, in the last two months, gave coverage to Erdogan for 36,000 minutes and to Kılıçdaroğlu for 32 minutes. That's how skewed the information ecosystem was. And this is the state-owned channel. There are others, when you look at the overall media, there are other pro-government channels that went even to further extremes. Another uh, you know, indication for you, I have a I have numbers from a company that does not only polling, but they get access to uh, viewership details of about 620,000 smart TVs in Turkey. So on that basis, uh, they can basically you know, assess how the information flows in households. 89% of the people that watched Erdogan on television never watched Kılıçdaroğlu. 18% of the Kılıçdaroğlu electorate never watched Erdogan. That's how polarized the information ecosystem was. So therefore, don't underestimate the power of the control of the narrative in these type of uh, environments. Three, coupled with this one, is don't come to the race unprepared about what you're going to do with regard to disinformation and, and negative campaigning. 
This also has been, you know, a, a lesson learned, I think, because one of the things that really shifted and the reason why we ended up with a lower degree of mobilization on the side of the opposition has to do with the very crude, very raw, very false disinformation that was propagated by the government and the state television. So much so that, you know, in the final days of the campaign, the president himself showed a fabricated content with the PKK supporting Kılıçdaroğlu. Over and over again, this was, showed, this was shown on, uh, on television. Yeah. Just to visually explain, PKK leaders, I mean commanders in commando fatigue, clapping to the, and singing to the campaign song of Kılıçdaroğlu, behind Kılıçdaroğlu. This, was, this never happened, of course. It was doctored, but it was on mega screens and rallies and on television. And I think people lost sense of reality. Yeah. What was reality? What was fake with yeah, it's like the, huge consequences. The, the infamous Goebbels narrative, right? When you spew a lie over and over again, people start to believe you. So that's about control of the, uh, of the narrative and the information ecosystem. Now, what, can you, what, could have, what could you do to respond to that? Well, basically, the political psychologists tell you that you have to be prepared for this, and you need to pre-bunk. You need to prime your electorate knowing what's going what's to be thrown at you. None of this was done. Fourth point, it's not the economy, stupid in a very polarized environment. It's the distributional consequences of that economy that matters. And that's why many of us, and here I, you know, I, I also have to accept the blame, we thought that just because the economy was doing badly, Erdogan would lose. The economy was indeed doing badly. But in fact, with all the populist measures that the government took, which is now basically taking us Turkey to about 9% of a budget deficit to GDP ratio by the end of the year. This is how populist these measures was, were. Lowering the retirement age to 49, the French among us might have a sense of what that means. Uh, 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 increasing the minimum wage uh, to you know, an extraordinarily high level never seen since 2001. Uh, all, all suspending uh, natural gas payments for households on the back of basically Russia suspending uh, delay terms for Turkey's purchases of natural gas and things like that made it so that the Erdogan electoral, electorate did not feel the impact of high inflation as much as the rest of the population. So when you look at, for instance, the um, uh, c uh, consumer confidence, it, went, it started to go up at the time when inflation was going up. And that's very difficult to understand at first, but it's basically because of this. And finally, uh, and this is about post-elections, by the way, don't hide in your corner when you lose. This is exactly what the Turkish opposition is doing now. They're pretending that they haven't lost, that 48% is a victory. There is no accountability. There is no mea culpa. It's as if, you know, Nothing has happened and, you know, everything is going in the right direction. It is not. There is a very real angst and a very real anger towards that behavior. So don't hide in your corner. So instead of the government, it's the opposition having a legitimacy issue in Turkey right now. Um, let me talk about Erdogan's next term, Erdogan 3.0. Um, there was a sigh of relief uh, last week when he named his cabinet, surprisingly made up of moderates. Uh, and a departure from the previous cabinet, which was largely anti-Western nationalist figures, some coming from the ultra-nationalist MHP with very strong um, um, 
Eurasianist sentiments, some of them, particularly the Minister of Interior, stood out as someone who not only defended and executed some of the rights violations, but also day in, day out, took a very anti-American, publicly anti-American tone, anti-LGBT tone, and uh, you know, on issues like Russia, relations with Russia, you called United States as uh, sort of trying to uh, do another coup in Turkey by way of elections. So that it's interesting that Erdogan parted ways with some of their more toxic figures and brought in Erdogan loyalists that are largely uh, seen as moderates within the AKP worldview, including um, sort of um, the intelligence chief Hakan Fidan, who's now uh, foreign minister. It's going to be an interesting and difficult transition after having been head of Turkish intelligence for many years. But he's someone that's led the peace process with the Kurds in the past, is certainly uh, uh, loyal to Erdogan, but has worked well with his Western counterparts over the years. Replace, he's replaced at the intelligence by Ibrahim Cullen, uh, who used to be Erdogan's spokesman and, and a person who has spoken at ECFR events. Uh, Vice President Cevdet Yilmaz, coming from a Kurdish background, again, someone who's he's done his graduate work in the States. And, um, and of course, Mehmet Shimshek, who's going to be the economy czar, Merrill Lynch background, somebody who has long advocated Turkey's uh, return to uh, a predictable, orthodox economic policies. So these have given people a sigh of relief. Not that it would be enough to... Uh, reverse Turkey's democratic backsliding, not that it would be uh, miraculously help Turkey's economic problems, which I hope we can touch upon, but because the, the, the sort of the more toxic elements within the system se seem to be uh, out, and also it may be a signal that Erdogan wants a reset with the West. Reset with the West, I think he wants. President Erdogan wants to fix the two things he broke, the economy, relations with the West. But don't, but let's unpack that word. Reset on his own terms, right? Reset with the West, with Europe, with the United States does not necessarily mean Turkey wants to go back to the transatlanticist moment of a decade ago, two de decades ago reforms. It means Turkey wants, Erdogan wants an acceptance of his regional role, perhaps zone of influence, and his position as a non-aligned Rising power with a foot in each camp, accept me on my own terms. Um, this cabinet is less anti-Western and has worked well with the West. It doesn't make it pro-Western by definition. So I think these are definitions that we need to perhaps get rid of because they're not useful and instead focus on what the terms of that reset could be when it comes to you know, regional issues, certainly the war in Ukraine, where Turkey is 51% on board, not wholly on board, but also dealing with Russia, playing a balancing act. Can that be 55%? Can that be 52%? Um, maybe, uh, certainly, Turkish-US relations need stability. Turkish-European relations need stability. There's the Sweden question on NATO. I think there is really stuff to do on, in Africa, uh, and in the Middle East, not just cooperation on items that are that we all know, but also in pushing back against Chinese influence and uh, uh, and uh, stability issues. Um, this idea of a reset is new; it can work or it can fail. But perhaps the most important first test of it, the first test of it will be obviously Sweden. Sweden's NATO issue, um, what will happen at Vilnius, will President Erdogan sign off on, uh, on, on the NATO accession or will he? I have no doubt that there will be headline grabbing drama, you know, newspaper headlines and last minute issues and meetings and, you know, another meeting and so and so calling so and so and, you know, and all of that, like we saw in the last summit. But let me tell you uh, the sentiment in the in the in, in 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 the city where I'm coming from, Washington. It seems like the Biden administration has very quickly adjusted to the new reality, 
that Erdogan has won for a third term and will be in power for the next five years. There is a, a, almost a charm offensive. Uh, Jake Sullivan was on uh, Farid Zakaria's show uh, over the weekend calling Turkey a democracy. It's that Turkey is a democracy and we want to work with them on issues where we can. It's, 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 it's a stretch to call Turkey a democracy under the circumstances, but the fact that a senior Biden administration official has come out and said this, of course, is part of this desire to make it work. There, I'm sure there will be uh, uh, invitations to the, you know, for the for a White House visit at some point. I'm sure there'll be more meetings, a departure from the Biden administration's more of a social distancing policy. But the question is, what happens on Erdogan's key asks? Uh, there is almost, you know, I have been arguing for a long time that this issue, the Sweden issue, is not between Turkey and Sweden only, that what Erdogan wanted was, and I know some Swedish officials and former officials disagree with me, uh, but what Erdogan always wanted was some type of a concession uh, and a reset with the United States, and also what he could get uh, if he could get uh, some of his security demands, defense uh, needs met. Uh, Turkey has been trying to buy U.S. Uh, weapons and F-16s, has not been able to purchase a single U.S. military, uh, has not been able to purchase a single U.S. defense system since 2017, and it is almost looking like the F-16 issue is uh, is is almost. Uh, a quid pro for Sweden for Erdogan. I am not sure what the Biden administration will do on that. It is something that Congress, US Congress has to sign off on and their uh, Senate Foreign Relations Committee has questions and in particular, a uh, leader of the committee is, is, un, is not really, has, has signaled that he does not want to ratify this sale. So this is going to be the big story we hear uh, about over the next uh, few uh, weeks. And my sense is that in the end, no real sale, but sort of a charm offensive uh, and a promise from the uh, administration for a sale. Does that cut it for President Erdogan? A lot of people in Washington are optimistic that it will. I personally have learned over the years, both as a, as a journalist previously in my life as a journalist and now as a think tanker, not to second guess him. So it may and it may not, but I leave it to Sinan now to... Uh, on that note. On that note. Um, just very few minutes left, so I'm gonna, I try to be very, very short so that we can have at least a couple of questions from the floor. I think we maybe skip the questions and you have the questions <laughs> and, and, you know, or maybe we we'll have know. time for one question. Yeah. Um, two things. Erdogan's focus, at least for two or three years, will be on the domestic economy because it needs to be. Uh, a combination of this ill considered macro policies where Turkey ended up with a negative real interest rate of uh, about uh, 60%. <coughs> negative real interest rate. The difference between actual inflation and the policy rate was at minus 60. Uh, that has had a huge, li it, it built up huge liabilities in the Turkish economy. So the central bank today has neg net re negative reserves of minus 70 billion. Seven zero, which means that for a long time now, the central bank has been selling the money that we own in the Turkish banking system. So there is a real need uh, to recapitalize this economy. Uh, otherwise, there is a risk of a balance of payment crisis, a sudden stop. Uh, the next electoral you know, threshold will be in March, where there are local elections. Uh, so until then, at least, uh, the government cannot afford to be uh, generating yet another economic crisis. So a lot of focus will be domestic uh, in order to you know, uh, save, uh, salvage the economy. And that's going to put a you know, uh, sort of a, uh, that's going to be the main stabilizing factor in terms of Turkey's own outlook towards the outside. So I don't expect the new Erdogan government uh, to go back to its <coughs> antiques about Greece, uh, about EastMed. Uh, I'm hopeful about the uh, Sweden-NATO accession. 
just because he needs to have a calm, composed relationship with the rest of the world in order to save the economy. That's the, 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 the nuts and bolts of the argument. So One exception to that is Putin, because Putin did risk a lot, and he's going to get a return. He gave enormous support to Erdogan during the electoral cycle, uh, in a way that no other leader did, except perhaps uh, Aliyev, uh, and he's going to get a return on that. We don't know what that return will look like, uh, what he's going to ask, but nonetheless, there is a number of, you know, quite sizable brownie points with Putin right now. Can I ask you a question? Uh, so let's uh, say uh, the financial relationship with Russia continues. Putin has bankrolled President Erdogan's campaign. Uh, financial relationship with the Gulf continues, Azerbaijan. The authoritarian league support. Is that enough for Turkey no, to muddle through enough. economically? Well, muddle through, even not muddle through, because Turkey is still bleeding. So that's very clear. In yeah, that. it's very clear. You need something cool. bigger. You need something more substantive and you need something that is tenable in the long run. These are transactional deals that only help for a few weeks or a month at most, so then you're back at square one. So that's not the, that's not the solution. Uh, and uh, do you want to talk about Sweden issue a little bit? Well, I said, I was, I'm, I'm optimistic because in that framework, I think he will want to have a, you know, a composed relationship with the West, no stress in order to lower Turkey's risk uh, perception uh, and try to attract capital from, from the West because that's how the Turkish economy is structured. We, we are an open economy that gets its finance, its trade, its investment, its technology from the West. And trying to do politics as if that world didn't exist leads to uh, serious vulnerabilities. Specifically on the timeline, are you optimistic about a yes at the Vilnius summit or in sort of an open-ended? No, I think it's going to happen on the Vilnius summit. That's optimistic. I am not that optimistic for yeah. the record. Well, I've but, been proven but, to be wrong not that far ago. So, you know, don't. But I have to say what I hear in Washington kind of resonates with that. Uh, yeah. they, people seem similarly optimistic. Um, I think we have two more minutes. If Vesela doesn't mind, we can take a, yeah, question. a question. Yes. Oh, maybe two questions. Uh, yeah. Another one. Thank you very much. Uh, Peter Karabolev for uh, Bulgaria, uh, the newest ECFR member from this country. Please, a couple of words about the wave of nationalism in, in Turkey in these elections and many people from the opposition and the people surrounding Erdogan because we don't see hair of the Sultan in Istanbul. And the second one is uh, recently I heard uh, talking about the brain drain, even the numbers of one million bright minded Turks leaving the country in the next five years. And so, can we have yep. the question from the lady qu over there? The quick question, please. Thank you so much. Lolita Sigan from Riga, Latvia. I have a question about economy. Uh, you are saying that it will be very difficult to muddle through. So what, what could be done? Because it is clear that these benefits that you are enumerating, they have created quite a bit of demand. Thank you. Oh, Anna. Thank you. I'm Anna Diamantopoulou from Greece. Thank you very much for a very deep and informative uh, contribution. My question has to do with uh, the elections and with the future, Turkey 3.0. You referred and you presented a list of don'ts, which were the mistakes of the, of the opposition. My question is, was the identity issue in the core of the elections? So from the one side, the Islamic approach, and from the other side, the secular one. And if this is the case, on the one side, we have a, a very glorious narrative, the century of Turkey, Turkey regional power, etc., and the uh, Ottoman Empire were coming back. And on the other side, we had uh, more West, less refugees, uh, the onions campaign. I think that 
If this is the case and we have a win of uh, identity, it is a problem for the future of the whole region and for the West as well. But I'm not sure that this is the case. Uh, let's maybe pick questions then. But I'll start with this quickly and the brain drain issue. Um, uh, I think we're running over time, but we started two minutes late, so we can... <laughs> Fasola, sorry. Uh, look, uh, opposition said price hikes, Erdogan runs it like his farm, and uh, the price of onions, which you know that you need for every single Turkish dish, starts with sautéed onions. And the price of onions are through the roof. Uh, but people said in the end, I was listening to uh, you know, street interviews, you know, we looked at the price of onions and we looked at saving the country. We decided to save Turkey and give up on the onions. Because the rhetoric that the opposition is in bed with terrorists was very powerful. AI generated videos that they, the, the Kurdish support and all of that hyped up. Nationalism is the biggest color in Turkey across the political spectrum. Uh, honestly, I think in Turkey, the secular Islamist debate, uh, I feel like secularism has won but nationalism is one bigger. On the other issue though, uh, Kılıçdaroğlu's Alevi identity, the fact that he came from a minority background, what was the opposition thinking? There are two sectarian wars in Iraq and Syria right next door that have been waging. And in Turkey, uh, the main biggest majority of the country is Sunni conservative. Erdogan's original promise was the fact that he got Sunni conservatives 20, two decades ago around the idea of a democracy and change. Now he's got, you know, them, he's triggered a red wave. Instead of a blue wave for change, we ended up having a red wave, a conservative red wave. Brain drain issue uh, is a big topic. It has been happening for the last few years. It's now a bigger go to Berlin, go to any European city, go, to, go there are Turkish doctors now, there are Turkish engineers that are looking for jobs that are moving. People are trying to cross into the United States from Mexico, a hike in the uh, in the number of Turks. I live in uh, Washington now. You never used to see Turks. Just the other day, the sushi chef, some guy at a restaurant, the Uber driver, an engineering student, Student, so it is happening already, unfortunately. But Sinan, I think I, I want to be. I remain friends with Vesela, so uh, yeah. maybe it's time to uh, to say thank you. <laughs>